Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day. We thank Thee for all our manifold blessings to us, coming to us solely through the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We thank Thee that Thou hast saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to Thine own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, who, though He was rich, Yet for our sakes he became poor that we through his poverty might be rich. We thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for this wonderful example of faith that we see not only in Rahab, the phenomenon of faith, but the faith of the Gentiles, of which all of us are a member of that group. And we thank thee that thou hast set this day apart for thy service, and has also gloriously set this day apart for the sanctification of thy people. So we pray that thou wouldst sanctify us through thy truth, for thy word is truth. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are looking at Hebrews 11.31. Didn't imagine that we would be spending this amount of time on this verse. But as we've seen, it's a very important verse, not only for the fact that this is yet another example of the faith of God's people, not only for the fact that Rahab, once again, is not an eminent example of the faith that God gives his people, but she's an ordinary example. Just like the the Apostle Paul's testimony of being knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus, It's not an extraordinary testimony. It's a testimony of all of God's people. He knocks us off our high horse of self-righteousness and grants us repentance and faith. So, verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And so I hope you are seeing that all these men and two women, now we have our second woman, verse 31, are eminent examples of the faith that we have. And it is well worth our time to look into these men so that we can see this glorious salvation which God hath vouchsafed to his people. But if faith is In a conditional covenant, which is to say that if the reprobate, this is what the Reformed teachers of our day are telling us, if it is true to say that if the reprobate can come up with faith themselves, God will save them also, which is the essence of what is called the free offer of the gospel. If faith is something that you can come up with, then it must, it is and it must belong to the realm of the elite, which is to say those people who are able to come up with it as opposed to those who don't. But if faith is the gift of God, as we're told everywhere in Scripture, specifically, and uh, I don't think we've looked at this verse, but Philippians 1.29, don't you love this verse? For unto you is given. Let's look at that. First for uh, Philippians 1.20. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ. Ephesians, Philippians. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, which is to say for the sake of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. It is given to us to believe on Christ. And so, This faith, since it comes from God, is very instructive toward us. And if we look into this faith in the person of Rahab, as in these all all these other personages in Hebrews eleven, it is akin to a diamond, which from whatever angle we view the diamond, it is gloriously refulgent. And especially in this person, as we just said, 
of Rahab because not only is she an eminent example of faith, she is also a picture of the foreshadowing of the coming in of the Gentiles. And we're all Gentiles. Because unlike Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and Joshua, she was not a Jew after the flesh. But she was indeed a foreshadowing of what we are. Ephesians 2, we're going to be looking at Ephesians, uh, why don't we just go ahead and read this. We're going to look at the faith of Rahab from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, which speaks specifically of the coming in of the Gentiles, as opposed to the Jews. And we read, Ephesians 2, 11, Wherefore remember that being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. What a glorious passage. We have hitherto looked at Rahab as she was a female and as she was a harlot. But today we're going to look at her from another standpoint, as we just said, and that is the standpoint of the fact that she was an adumbration, a foreshadowing of the coming in of the Gentiles later on, many hundred years afterwards. Though we will not leave this idea that she was a harlot because as we hope to go into this idea next week, Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've gone astray from our husband. We have turned everyone to, our, to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so we're looking at Rahab from the standpoint of her being not a Jew, but a Gentile. Nevertheless, being the elect of God. And so we're going to meditate on this passage today that we just read from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. First of all, we see in verse 12, which says again, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. First of all, number one, she was, and we were, aliens. And I've spent nearly half of my adult life in the Orient, and so I have a pretty good idea of what it means to be an alien. Every time I go through customs, look over the door, over the booth, to where it says, I look for the word alien. An alien is a person who doesn't belong to the country in which he resides. And we see this is a perfect picture of Rahab and of us as Gentiles. She was, as we're told in verse 12, an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. And Paul is telling us, and I will, by God's grace, every time the text even smells of this, hammer this home. She was an alien of the commonwealth or from the commonwealth of Israel, which has nothing, as we hope to see in a few minutes, nothing whatsoever to do with ethnicity. I have no, I feel no camaraderie with any Mideasterners in the world. Have not, has nothing to do with ethnicity. The commonwealth of Israel refers to the people of God. Ethnic Israel, once again, has nothing to do. Ethnic Israel was not, is not, and never shall be the people of God. There are two passages in Scripture which cannot be misunderstood. They are so clear. Let's look at the first one, Romans 9, 8. 
This is not only important because it's important. It's not only important because it's mentioned in Scripture, but it's important in our, in our particular context, in the age in which we live. Where Baptists in general and dispensationalists in particular have nearly single-handedly destroyed the church. <clears throat> Romans 9, verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. What could be clearer? Ethnic Israel is not, was not, never shall be the children of God. But, you see the antithesis? But the children of the promise are counted for the sea, which we have been going over again and again and again. So first of all, Rahab and we, who are represented by Ahab, was an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. Secondly, verse 13 tells us that she was not only an alien, we were not only aliens, uh, but and we were not aliens with respect to the bloodline of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, but we were aliens from the blood of Christ. That's the point. So the second point. Aliens from the blood. Last week we spoke of, uh, or we referenced Romans chapter 8, which says, for they that are after the flesh, notice care, let's look back at that. This is so important to get this idea down, cemented in our thinking. Romans 8 verse beginning with verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Dispensationalism is nothing other than carnal mindedness. Nothing other than. That's why they place such great importance on the flesh of the Jews. Another passage, which, once again, cannot be mistaken. Let's read the first one again. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, the physical descendants of Abraham, are not the children of God. Romans 2, 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Could anything be clearer? He is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. If you are a physical descendant of Abraham, you are not a Jew in the biblical sense. What could be clearer? So, Rahab was an alien, not owing to the fact that she was not of the bloodline, of Abraham, but she was an alien owing to the fact that she was in no way, shape, or form related to, had no relationship to the promise of Abraham. That's the point. And in verse, back to uh, Ephesians 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called a circumcision in the flesh made by hands. This totally destroys Baptist theology. In general, and once again, dispensationalism in particular. Not only the insane people who think that who believe in a type of rapture where cars will be without drivers and crashing into one another and into telephone poles, carnage on the streets. But Paul, in saying you were Gentiles in the flesh, what does he mean by this? The next sentence tells us, who are called, notice the word called. He doesn't say you were uncircumcision. He says you were called uncircumcision by that which is, and he doesn't say you were called uncircumcision by the circumcision. He says, you were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision. And then, 
lest he be misunderstood. He's, he adds this. Not only, not only called the circumcision in the flesh, but called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. What could be clearer? In other words, you were called uncircumcision, you Gentiles, you were called the uncircumcision. Not because you did not have a medical procedure performed on you. Get that in your heads. You were called the uncircumcision not because you did not have a certain medical procedure performed on you. But Paul says that you were called uncircumcision. Your being called uncircumcision had nothing whatsoever to do with your flesh. Because as we just said, he immediately adds circumcision in the flesh made by hands. In other words, true uncircumcision is not circumcision of the flesh and true circumcision has nothing to do with circumcision in the flesh. Which is to say, your uncircumcision as a Gentile, our uncircumcision, their uncircumcision was true, but it had nothing to do with a physical procedure. And if you doubt that, you just look back at Romans 2.28 again. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. We keep quoting Philippians 3.3, don't we? We are the circumcision. Not we are the new circumcision. We are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And so the men in Rahab's house we must deduce were not uncircumcision were not uncircumcised owing to the fact that they did not have a medical procedure performed on them. They were uncircumcised because they were strangers to the covenants of promise. Back to the definition of an Israelite. A Rahab Israelite. Our working definition of a Christian. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. This is the true circumcision. And notice carefully in the text, particularly in Joshua chapter 2 as we've seen, Rahab's treatment of the spies shows this, does it not? The love that she showed for them. Because she was of the household of faith. And they were of the household of faith. The true circumcision. Thirdly, we see something in the text, verse we're looking at verse 12 now, Ephesians 2, 12, which reminds us of our recent study in the concept of Hebrew parallelism. Notice carefully there are two clauses in verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, notice carefully, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and you were strangers from the covenants of promise. You see it? Hebrew parallelism. The first element of the first clause. Aliens. First element in the second clause. Strangers. That's easy enough, isn't it? An alien is a stranger. A stranger is an alien. But what's really interesting is when we get to the, the second element of the first clause and compare it with the second element of the second clause. Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel strangers from the covenants of promise we said that first of all regarding Hebrew parallelism that it is a pedagogical device it is a teaching mechanism and secondly we say that the way that it teaches us is by asking questions of the text and this is a prime example of it so we look at the second element of the first clause and the second element of the second clause and we ask this question what is the relationship between the commonwealth of Israel and the covenants of promise? Or even better, how is the commonwealth of Israel parallel to and synonymous with the covenants of promise? 
And why is this important? It's important because if this is indeed is, if this indeed is Hebrew parallelism, then this is a double whammy against Baptist theology. Every nation has a so-called national identity. I heard a, an advertisement one time regarding our national identity. Baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. This Hebrew parallelism teaches us that the identity, the national identity of Israel had nothing to do with the flesh. Do you see this? The national identity of Israel was that they possessed, you see it, strangers from the, aliens from the, excuse me, um, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, meaning strangers from the covenants of promise. Their national identity was the fact that they possessed the covenants of promise. See the Hebrew parallelism and the importance of that. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 4. It tells us this, this exact same thing. Romans 9, 4. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the services of God and the promises. The covenants. And the promises. So. You say. I hope you're thinking this way. If the covenants of promises were only vouchsafed to the Jews. Then the Jews in ethnic Israel was special. Were they not? But if we can prove as we can from scripture. That these promises, that these covenant promises were given to certain people before Abraham and before Jacob. Then we can prove our point that it has nothing to do with ethnic Israel. This destroys this concept of the Jews being special because of their ethnicity. Let's look at the first covenant promise in scripture. And it is found in Genesis chapter 3. Before Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And I will put enmity. Between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. So we see the first promise. The first covenant promise was spoken, interestingly enough, to Satan himself, saying that the seed, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between Satan and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. The seed of the woman is Christ and those who belong to him. The seed of the serpent is is the reprobate. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. And so the first covenant promise was given, not to Abraham or to Jacob, not to Israel, not to Abraham, but to God's people in Christ, way before Abraham. So we see that Romans 9, 4 and Ephesians 2, 12 tell us that this, um, as we just saw, the commonwealth of Israel has to be parallel to the covenants of promise. And since the first promise came way before Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and since this first promise was given to the people of God before them, this proves that the Gentiles, including us, were not aliens. Listen to this once again. We're hammering it home. This proves, without any doubt or cavil, that we Gentiles were not aliens owing to separation from the bloodline of a Jew, but owing to what we see once again in Psalm 147, verse 19.
He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any Gentile, any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. So this covenant is not physical, is not national, it is not ethnic, but it is spiritual. And owing to Romans chapter 8, which we just read again, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, and they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. So what would we expect carnal people to do when reading the scripture? We would expect them to believe that ethnic Israel, physical Israel, were the people of God. What do we find that they do? Exactly the same thing. In fact, they call the church, as we've said recently, the coming into the church, the coming into the Gentiles, they call the church a parenthesis in God's dealings with his people. Fourthly, Ephesians 2.12 tells us that they were strangers and to be a stranger is to be without hope. Verse 12. Stranger from the covenants of promise having no hope. They had no hope because they were strangers from the covenants of promise. And this was brought home very poignantly to Rahab because she saw as we remember from the text, she saw that God destroyed the, the Egyptians in the Red Sea. She voiced this. She saw that God not only destroyed the Egyptians in the Red Sea, not only did he destroy the two kings of the Amorites, but she saw that the very presence of the spies in Jericho was a determination of God to destroy the citizens, all the citizens of Jericho. And there's no doubt. Let's look at the text once again. Joshua 2, 9 and 10. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. So, therefore, although there's no therefore in the text, although... Uh, Rahab was convinced that not only were all the citizens of Jericho to be destroyed, that, but that this included she herself, included Ahab herself, Rahab herself. But interestingly enough, it is not although she was convinced that the citizens of Jericho would be destroyed, including herself. She still had hope. No, that's not the idea. The idea in the text is the same idea found throughout Scripture and in this passage in particular. She had hope because she saw the destruction of the citizens of Jericho, including herself. Therefore, her hope was based on that. Which is a beautiful picture of the gospel because this shows that Rahab was caused to ask the most important religious question, was she not? How can I, seeing myself to be a citizen of Jericho, seeing myself to be the object of God's wrath, how can I not be destroyed? And so her hope resided in that question, as our hope does. Because to despair of self is to hope because this is the only hope that there is. To despair of self is to hope in Christ. Rahab knew that she was to be destroyed. Not only that she was to be destroyed, not despite 
who she was, but because of who she was. And with the, we think once again of that line of my favorite hymn. Same idea. Oh, how can I? This is what she thought. Most important religious way. Oh, how can I? Whose nate is fear is dark, whose mind is dim, before the ineffable appear, and on my naked spirit bear that uncreated being. Because to ask that question is to understand, as we did, we mentioned this again yesterday. Proverbs 9 and 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Once again, Hebrew parallelism. You see it? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the holy. Understanding. The fear of the Lord. Parallel with the knowledge of the holy. Only people who realize what Rahab realized here. That she must be destroyed owing to what she was. Fear the Lord. Rahab saw God as holy. As infinitely separated from her. Since she saw herself to be pollution in God's universe. In other words. She saw that if God did not destroy her, he must cease to be God. That's our only hope. Because to ask this question, and still to be alive, not to be annihilated in despair, is to have hope. Because this question can only be asked by one who has been wrought on by the Holy Spirit of God. And so the question we must ask is this. From where did Rahab's hope come? Being this Gentile. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. And from the covenants of promise. This hope came from. Since she saw that she was to be destroyed. First of all. Secondly that she was to be destroyed because of what she was. Where did her hope come from? And the answer is, it came from faith. Rahab, we must be convinced, had hope. And the entire text tells us that look how confident she was. Look how joyful she was throughout the entire text. She had hope because she had faith in Christ. Rahab had hope, though objectively speaking, According to her own testimony, the destruction of the Egyptians in the Red Sea, the destruction of the two Amorite kings, objectively speaking, she had no hope. Because subjectively speaking, here it is, the gospel. Because subjectively speaking, she believes something about herself. She believes something about herself which Calvinists bend over backwards and work over time to keep from believing and saying. Because they say that total depravity does not mean that the sinner is as bad as he can be. Which means, according to Proverbs 9 10, they have no knowledge of the holy. That God is holy. Including the man that wrote that book, The Holiness of God, in which he says God does not always act with justice. That is the very opposite of what Rahab saw and believed. These men believe that God loves everybody. And concentrate on this idea. Let me state it this way. They believe, have you ever meditated on why they believe that God loves everybody? It's personal. They believe God loves everybody because he loves them. <clears throat> Rahab believed. Not only that God hated her, but that God must, his wrath must be poured out on her. And therefore, she had hope. Fifthly, Ephesians 2.12 tells us that she was not only, and we were not only, without hope, but that we were without God. Meditate on this idea. Without hope and without God. Now we must say. 
at the same time that as Paul tells us in Acts 17, 28, God, he says, in whom we live and move and have our being. So in an, in an absolute sense, there is no way for anyone to be completely without God. As we were told also in Psalm 139, as we just read this past week, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? And whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up in hell into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. So what does it mean to be without God? Second Chronicles 32 tells us, Verse 7, be strong and courageous, be not afraid or dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. That's what it means to have God, to have God. Is to have God on our side. As Martin Luther says, we're not the right man on our side. Our striving would be losing. So, we were without God, but now we are with God. And then, not only... but. Not only does the text say without God, but without God in the world. And think of that. Think of all the dangers in this world in which we live. I remember one time they put a traffic light up in an intersection. We passed through twice a week, every week. They put up a, why did they put up a traffic light? The same reason why they frequently put traffic lights up. Because there was a horrible collision in which people died. So the question we ask is, why was I not killed at that intersection at that time? Not because there was no danger involved, but because my time hadn't come. Without God in the world, with respect to illness, think of the multiple illnesses that are terminal illnesses that you could contract at any moment, and yet you haven't. Without God. In the world. And the most terminal of all illnesses. Is the illness of life. What's the life expectancy of life? Zero percent. And Paul. In 1 Corinthians 15. Did not say oh death where are you? He said oh death where is our sting? Rahab knew. Get a hold of this. Rahab knew. Through faith that the universe exists to destroy people like her for God's purposes. That's faith. Calvinists tell us 24-7 that God loves all people. And yet, we're told from Scripture again and again and again, read, as I said, read the Old Testament with this idea in mind. The next time you read through it, God saves His people through the destruction of the wicked. We just read this past week. Let's look at it briefly. Psalm 136. How a person can read this psalm and come up with the ideas that they have is beyond me. Well, it isn't beyond me because God has kept the truth from them. Psalm 136. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for His good 
for his mercy endureth forever. This is what Rahab saw. She saw not only does, not God, does God not love every man, but God loves his people so much that he destroys people like her for their sake. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy. Try to put this all together as you read the text. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters. For his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night for his mercy endureth forever. To him that smote Egypt here it is, in their firstborn. For his mercy endured forever. And brought out Israel from among them. For his mercy endured forever. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endured forever. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endured forever. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endured forever. But antithesis, here it is, overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. For his mercy. Endure it forever. To him, which led his people through the wilderness for his mercy endureth forever. To him, which smote great kings for his mercy endureth forever. And slew famous kings for his mercy endureth forever. Do you see the names of the famous kings? Sion, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, the king of ba Bashan, the exact same thing that Rahab saw, for his mercy endureth forever and gave their land for, an, for a heritage for his mercy endureth forever even an heritage unto Israel his servant for his mercy endureth forever who remembered us in our low estate think of the Magnificat for his mercy endureth forever and hath redeemed us from our enemies for his mercy endureth forever who giveth food to all flesh for his mercy endureth forever O give thanks unto the Lord under the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. Some people, the Calvinists, read verses 1 through 24 and come to verse 25 and act as if the first 24 verses never happened. That can only mean that God gives food to the reprobate so that they can be destroyed for the sake of his people. For his mercy endureth forever. And so we see Rahab saw just as clearly as Abraham, as Isaac, and as Jacob saw this gospel which belonged to her just as well as it did they. Sixthly, verse 13 tells us in Ephesians 2, but now, the most important religious question, how can a man be just with God? This is one of the most glorious of these verses, of these but now verses in Scripture. Most important religious question. 
How can a man be just with God? And the answer is in these two words. But now. The true gospel. Is. This answer to the most important religious question. As Christ said to Nicodemus. You must. Be born again. In other words Nicodemus. You must. Let Jesus. If you are. Tired of the load of your sin, let Jesus come into your heart. Open up your heart. Receive Jesus. In. The most influential evangelist of the 20th century. We must explain this but now because the false gospel also has a but now. It must be explained. The most influential evangelist of the 20th century also had a but now. He wrote a book called How to Be Born Again. <clears throat> and this is the distinguish, distinguishing factor. The distinction between the but now of the false gospel and the but now of the true gospel. The but now of the false gospel is an active but now. But now, testimony time. I was a sinner, but now... I gave my heart to Christ. But now I did something. I was a sinner, but now I opened my heart to Jesus. But the true gospel's but now is a passive but now. As we see in the text. And as we see what Christ indeed really did say to Nicodemus. You must be born again. Passive voice. Something has to happen to you outside yourself for you to have any hope. Which is what Rahab most definitely saw. Romans 3, 19 and 20. Same exact idea. The same exact gospel. The same exact answer to the most important religious question. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, but now what did you do? But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested to you. That you have no hope in yourself. As Rahab saw. Through faith she saw, saw her only hope was in the promises. The promised Messiah. We don't know how she knew that. But she knew it by faith. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The entire Old Testament. And we see that Hebrews, excuse me, that Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. Listen to the rest of the verse. It's exactly the same thing. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off were made nigh. Passive voice. Do you see it? By the blood of Christ. And then seventhly, and finally, we see yet another illustration of our beautiful text. One of our favorite texts of late. Exodus eleven seven. That ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. How does the Lord put a difference? What does the text tell us? You were sometimes far off, but you were made not by the blood of Christ. And nothing else. And so in conclusion, we saw first of all from Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Rahab, as a representative of all of us Gentiles. We were aliens. But we were not aliens because we were aliens to the bloodline of Jacob, to the bloodline of Abraham. We were aliens 
owing to the fact that we were aliens to the blood of Christ. Secondly, we Gentiles. First of all, we were aliens. Secondly, we were aliens from the bloodline of Christ. Thirdly, the Hebrew parallelism in verse 12 tells us that we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. The commonwealth of Israel is parallel to and synonymous with not ethnic Israel, but the covenants of promise. Fourthly, to be a stranger to God's covenant promises is to be without hope. Fifthly, to be a stranger to God's covenant promises is to be, is to be without God on your side. But he, indeed, as we saw from Psalm 136, to have God against you. Sixthly, but now we see in the text, the gospel comes in. The two-word answer to the most important religious question, and then finally, what is it that makes the but now difference? And it is always and only the blood of Christ. Next week, we want to look at, Lord willing, the importance of this idea. We've alluded to it before, but this idea in our original text of, let's look at it again. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not. This idea of Rahab being a harlot it's very easy to misunderstand, is it not? 1 Peter 2 8. Let's look at it again. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. God appoints people to stumble at the word, and so he gives them verses to stumble over. This is another one. How so? As soon as people read that, a, that Rahab was a harlot, oh, she was one of those bad people. You see it? Stumble right over that into hell. We, being Gentiles, we're all harlots. Because what does the Old Testament say of those who have left God? We've left God in Adam. We've gone a whoring after other gods. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this another Lord's Day. We thank thee for the clarity of thy word. We thank thee that we always, being thy people, we always had hope. But our hope wasn't in being connected in any way, shape, or form with ethnic Israel. Our hope was in the promises. And we came to see by thy grace the wonder of the promises because thou didst cause us to see through thy law to drive us to total despair of any righteousness of our own and that our only hope is in the perfect righteousness of of the Lord Jesus Christ, which comes to us, which is imputed to us through faith, yea, the faith of the harlot Rahab. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.